Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, welcome to the first in-person Frizzell series and speaker event since, well, four years. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Sabina Sheck. I'm the director of academic programs for SIGU, and I have been working with the Frizzell series since its inception. Um, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about SIGU. If you haven't heard, you've probably heard because you've all been at our other events, but SIGU is the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization. It is an interdisciplinary platform for critical thinking, advanced research, and innovative pedagogy on the societal and spatial dimensions of climate change biodiversity loss, and other types of environmental transformation. SIGU has a thriving undergraduate program, many of you are here, thank you, and a new PhD certificate, which we just launched, and a robust set of program, pram, programming of events like this one today. So today's event is very exciting because it highlights two of SIGU's initiatives. In collaboration with the college, the Frizzell series is a student-organized series intended to commemorate the life, accomplishments, and aspirations of Alexandra Frizzell. The series engages with the various fields from year to year, generally related to agriculture, environment, and or health. The series aims to better enable students to interact with thought and practice leaders and to build skills and knowledge to take on major global challenges. I would like to welcome and thank Tyler Frizzell, the father of Alex, Alex Frizzell, who's here today. Thank you, Tyler, and welcome. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Professor Evan Carver, who's right here, um, and the students of Expositions Magazine, who are throughout the room, um, who organized this year's event. With support from the college, Expositions is a student-run publication for environmental and urban studies journalism. To quote from their website, it centers student writing and photography that investigates the heart of our diverse cities and ecosystems. Specifically wanted to credit the student organizers of today, today's event, Sean Armanian, who you'll hear from shortly, Stella Bennett, Jonathan Garcia, C. Hugh, and Harrison Knight. I would also like to thank Carlo Diaz, SIGU's Project and Communications Coordinator, for his hard work on this event, and Daniel Smith, SIGU's Department Administrator, for her support. I don't know if Daniel's here. Uh, I don't see her. Um, before we begin the main program, I'd also like to welcome and thank Alice Lee. Alice is an alumni of the college and friend of Alexander Frizzell who helped create this series. So I've asked Alice to say a few words about Alex. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Alice. Um, Alex Frizzell was a close friend of mine when we were um, both undergrads here at UChicago. Uh, I met her my second year and um, my 10 year reunion is coming up this month, so I'll let you do the math. <laughs> um, so most of you probably didn't know her, but I'd like to share just you know a little bit about her just so that you guys can get a sense. I think she'd really love to hear this talk because it's really the interdisciplinary nature across a bunch of different fields would really strike her fancy, I think. Um, so I met Alex my second year. Um, I think we were both econ undergrads, and so we bonded over a lot of late night problem sets. I think one of my favorite memories was um, we had econometrics P sets due Thursday at midnight, and we would quickly drop them off at 11.53 p.m., then we'd drive with our friend Catherine to Chinatown to get late night boba from St. Alps. <laughs> Um, another favorite memory, and then maybe you'll see a theme here, was that apparently the Dunkin' Donuts, I think on 53rd if it's still there, um, at 3 a.m. is when they throw out their old donuts that you can get for free or for a very heavy discount <laughs> because they're making the fresh donuts for the next day. Um, so I had a lot of really good memories with Alex, um, late nights, uh, conometrics. I think fourth year we were both in Sabina's class and that was a really fun time. Um, I think Alex's ability to just really be there as um, a good friend and uh, be able to share and build community around her was something that we all admire and still really remember um, a lot about her. So um, thanks, excited to see the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. I, I can't believe it's been that long since we were having all those meetings um, about how, how we could best create something um, to, to you know, honor Alex and her um, wide range and portfolio of interests. So um, thank you for, for being there for all these, these years. Uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Shant Armanian, who will tell you more about today's program. Shant is a third year undergraduate student studying urban studies and architectural studies. His work investigates the intersection between architecture, identity construction, and artistic engagement. Shant currently serves as the publication team leader of Expositions Magazine, and he's gonna introduce our program.
Hello, uh, I'm Sean Armenian. I'm a third year student. Um, and today I proudly represent the uh, editorial board of Expositions Magazine, um, which is, as Professor Scheck mentioned, the premier urban and environmental publication at the University of Chicago. So our team has worked closely with our parent committee, SIGU, over the last few months um, to organize this evening's event, um, but especially in identifying this year's distinguished uh, Frizzell speaker. So naturally, we thought back on those um, contemporary authors and scholars and professionals that started the most um, fruitful or uh, provocative conversations in our SIGU courses. Professor Evan Carver's writing The City um, was, I mean, in some sense, the genesis for Expositions Magazine, but it was also um, many of our initial forays to the expansive catalog. That's um, Mr. Kimmelman's work. Throughout his writing, um, Michael Kimmelman invites readers to join him as he explores a range of built environments, to bask under the canyon-like crevices of um, new museum atriums, to flaneur through Jackson Heights multicultural sidewalks, to pick up a book and take a seat within the creamsicle orange nooks of Brooklyn's newest public library, and to wade in the shallow and storied waters of the Los Angeles River on a sweltering afternoon. These moments clue us into cultures and environments that have the potential to inform our own academic and professional endeavors. We're excited to extend these conversations beyond the, class, the, beyond the classroom and are proud to welcome Michael Kimmelman to University of Chicago. Our interlocutor for the evening is Nutan Barani, a fierce champion of the continuum of communities and a thoughtful leader of progresses to shape, processes to shape places where people want to be. As an architect and maker with a deep background in environmental sustainability, Newton has a propensity toward existing buildings and in-between spaces. Newton has spent most of her career in non-traditional practice, working directly with neighborship part, neighborhood partners on projects at a wide variety of scales. Nutan um, is currently the Associate Director of Design and University Partnerships at Arts and Public Life and a lecturer in the Humanities Division at the University of Chicago. Previously, Nutan was Lead Design Manager for Place Lab at the University of Chicago, where she was thought and practice leader for building projects. Prior to coming to the University of Chicago, she was the Managing Director for CB&I Sustainable Design Solutions of Illinois. Nutan is also a volunteer in Chicago Public Schools where her children attend, co-leading initiatives for caregivers of students with disabilities. Our guest, Michael Kimmelman, is the architecture critic of the New York Times. He has reported from more than 40 countries, was previously the Times' chief art critic, and based in Berlin, created the Abroad column, covering cultural and political affairs across Europe and the Middle East. Twice a Pulitzer Prize finalist, he's the founder and editor-at-large editor at large of a new journalistic venture focused on global challenges and progress called Headway. Please join me in welcoming Newton Barani and Michael Kimmelman. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles Frizzell, for having me here and for coming um, and for remembering Alex. Um, so uh, I'm going to start today. I'm going to wander around on a bunch of subjects. Um, because like most journalists, I have the attention span of a flea. But I'm going to start by asking you to answer some questions. Just see, I, I have my motivations, but I just want to see where we are on, on a few subjects. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I want you to answer yes or no by raising your hand. So in 2009, the European Union pledged um, that its emissions in 2020 would be 20% 20 lower than they were in 1990. So did, did they meet this goal? Um, just by raising hands, did they? Yes, they met this goal. No, they did not meet this goal. So nobody raised their hands for yes, they did. Most people raised their hands for no, they didn't. Some of you are just keeping your cool, which I think is fine. Uh, they surpassed their goal. Emissions fell by more than 20%. Okay, you're 0 for 1. What progress do you expect we've made in reducing extreme poverty in the world? So in 1990, 
36% of the world's population lived on less than $1.25 a day. And the UN pledged in 2000 to cut that percentage in half as of 2015, sorry. Okay, so uh, did extreme poverty go down? Raise your hands. Did they meet that goal, in other words? Okay, did it go up? You see, you guys are catching on, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, the answer was that they exceeded the goal. It went down to 12%. Have we made progress in getting uh, people clean water in 1990, about 25% of the world's population did not have drinking water from an approved source like a pipe or a well. So again, a pledge by the UN 2020, cut that in half to 12%. Was that goal met by 2015? Was the goal met? Okay, was the goal not met? All right, now you're all really, this is, you're gaming this. Yes, the answer is the goal was met. In fact, it was exceeded. It's 7% and it was met three years ahead of schedule. One more. Um, corporate deforestation. In 2010, the Consumer Goods Forum pledged to help end deforestation on behalf of its roughly 400 corporate members. And some companies like Nestle and Carrefour vowed to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. Okay, so let's do it this way. 400 companies, how many of them succeeded? 400, raise your hand. 200, raise your hand. 100, raise your hand. None. You see, you gotta stay on your toes. None. So, it's not all good news. Okay, one more. I have to give this to you this one because that's what I'm going to talk about a bit of. All right, is homelessness up or down in the United States nationwide since 2000? This is an easy one. Is it up? Is it down? Want to try again? <laughs> is it up? Is it down? Yes, it's down. That's, that's correct. It was 650,000 uh, people in 2007. It's 580,000 now. And I will return to this, and I'm glad to talk about it at length. But I hope it surprises you. It's a number that certainly surprised me. I hope many of these numbers may surprise you. And it's at least, I think, a small sign of hope. I fear, you know, we've become a nation of pessimists and kind of victims of our own doom scrolling and fatalism. So, uh, I worry about that because we really can't afford it. So let me begin. A few years ago, I wrote a series on climate change and global cities. And um, one of the cities I wrote about was Jakarta, which you see here um, on the coast of Indonesia. Jakarta is sinking, as you can tell. Um, this area has sunk by about 20 feet uh, right here along the sea in recent years. Another city I wrote about was Mexico City, which is not on any coast, um, but a mile high and far from the sea, uh, in the middle of Mexico, where climate change is exacerbating crises around access to clean water, uh, informal development, urban sprawl, economic inequality. One study a few years ago predicted that 10% of Mexicans aged 15 to 65 could eventually try to emigrate north as a result of rising temperatures, droughts, and floods, potentially scattering millions of people and heightening, obviously, extreme political tensions over immigration. The effects of climate change are varied uh, and opportunistic, but one thing is consistent. They're like sparks in the tinder. They expose existing vulnerabilities, inflaming troubles that politicians and city planners tend to ignore or pay, try to paper over. And they spread outward, defying borders. Climate change does not care about our property lines, after all. Around the world, extreme weather and water scarcity are accelerating repression, regional conflicts, and violence. We see the catastrophic effects of floods and hurricanes on the news every week. And I'm about to talk about one of them. And a Columbia University report found that where rainfall declines, the risk of a low-level conflict, I'm quoting here, escalating to a full-scale civil war, approximately doubles the following year. 
This was the case in Syria, for example, before the Civil War started. As you may know, the Pentagon's term for climate change is threat multiplier. So this is the first urban century in human history, the first time more people live in cities than do not, with predictions that three quarters of the global population will be urban by 2050. One third of us will live informally, meaning in slums or other makeshift settlements. By that point, according to another study, there may be more than 700 million climate refugees on the move. For some cities around the world, adapting to climate change can become a route to long-term prosperity, where societies are willing to listen, but adaptation can be costly and slow. It can run counter to the rhythms of political campaigns and headlong into entrenched interests and deep-rooted racial, social, and economic divisions, confounding business as usual. This is what I want to pack a little bit today, these divisions and how we might begin to think about them. So more recently, I wrote about the troubles around a plan to protect public housing developments on a stretch of lower Manhattan that flooded during Hurricane Sandy. Do any of you, none of you are probably old enough to really remember, do any of you remember Hurricane Sandy in 2012? Good, that's great. Sandy, as you may remember, made landfall near Atlantic City in New Jersey um, in September of that year, and it ravaged the New Jersey coast. It destroyed thousands of homes, and it inundated New York City with waves as high as 14 feet. The storm shut down Wall Street. It shut down power, as you see, um, uh, except for that one building, which is, of course, the Goldman Sachs building, which had its own power source. Um, and uh, for a while, it restored actually Manhattan's 17th century coastline. In other words, the flood filled in all the landfill that had ever been in Manhattan from the first times that colonists started to expand the island. So nature just always reclaims what belongs to it. Um, and it also swamped a cluster of public housing developments and a bedraggled strip of greenery built on landfill uh, along the East River built by Robert Moses, New York's famous notorious planning czar during the 1930s, a place called East River Park. The storm knocked out power to a quarter of a million people in that neighborhood, many of them poor and working class occupants of public and supportive housing developments adjacent to the park, I'll point them out in a second, and it caused tens of billions of dollars in damage across the region, killing more than 100 people. The scale of the calamity called for a federal response, and so the Obama administration came up with a novel federal competition called Rebuild by Design. Any of you heard of that? That's good, amazing. Teams of architects and engineers around the world were invited to conceive creative flood protection proposals in collaboration with members of the affected communities. And by far the largest federal grant ended up going in 2014, two years later, to a segment of a wider Lower Manhattan Resilience Plan called the Big U, um, which, among other things, aimed to protect residents in these public housing developments next to East River Park. Officials named this part of the project the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. So I'll get to it, but this is an early conception for uh, the big U, because it's shaped like a U in Lower Manhattan. Um, this is the Staten Island Ferry terminal landing. Um, and East River Park is around the corner here, and I'll, I'll get to it. There it is right there. So borrowing, I'll come back to this picture too, borrowing ideas from the Dutch. Um, oh, well, here you are, sorry. Yeah, so... Um, this is the Manhattan Bridge, and this is East River Park, but it's the plan for its renovation, which I'll get to. And these are the housing developments. Sorry, can you see this? Is it laser? I can't really. Anyway, if you look at the northern end of this park here, you'll see all of that development. And all along here, you see these blocks, sort of tower in the park blocks, and along the southern end here. Moses built all this landfill to create the park in the river, and then on that landfill, he also saw an opportunity to build housing. And then next to the housing, 
dividing the housing, ah, there it is, is this road which is called the FDR Drive, a highway, because of course you can't build without a highway, uh, which was Moses' idea, which separates the park from. The water came in this way, over here, and flooded these housing projects. So the plan was, um, borrowing from the Dutch, to redesign East River Park, and by the Dutch, I'll just say, I won't do a whole thing on the Dutch, but I assume you guys know that the Dutch are annoyingly good at uh, dealing with flooding, um, and so everyone talks about the Dutch. Um, I, I have many Dutch friends, I love the Dutch, but you know, whatever. I'll just do quickly and tell you, this is one of the, this is it's called the Mazankering, it's a giant, these are the size of two um, Eiffel Towers, and they close the main canal, channel really, that is uh, the main channel for Europe's largest shipping port in Rotterdam. Um, they build dikes, which are also parks. So they double up on this idea that if you're going to do something for resilience, it also has to have some social benefit. Um, here are um, swimming area and, and a basketball court that also is a catchment for floodwaters. Um, and I'll come back to this. So borrowing ideas from the Dutch, the plan, imagine that East River Park could withstand flooding from future sandy level events and a grassy berm or a reinforced hill along the highway would be raised that would uh, be built to barrier, act as a barrier effectively, holding back the floodwaters and protecting the housing developments on the other side. Under um, Mayor Bloomberg, the plan went through years of public workshops, town hall meetings, open houses attended by more than a thousand community members and the estimated price tag reached about $760 million. The architect, the lead architect on this project was Bjarke Ingels at the firm called Big, for those of you who follow architecture. Um, and then in 2018, the next mayor, Mayor de Blasio, uh, just changed plans. Behind closed doors, city agencies did what they called a constructability review. That is, they recalculated the proposal's costs and timeline, and they concluded it was in fact simply not feasible. The parks department said it didn't have the money, workers, or expect expertise, sorry, to maintain the infrastructure in a park built to flood, which is a big deal. The Department of Transportation, which as usual was prioritizing cars and, and trucks, decided that constructing the berm next to the highway would be too disruptive to traffic on the FDR drive. The electric company in New York, Con Ed, said no way because they have got power lines running beneath the park and the, they would have to be encased, which would take years and cost all sorts of risks and untold billions of dollars. So City Hall said they'd come up with an alternative plan despite all those years of community planning and this time it would cost twice as much, $1.45 billion. I want to remind you this is just a neighborhood park. And this required raising not a portion of the park, but the entire park, and then covering it over with 50 acres of eight to 10 feet of new landfill that would also keep Con Ed's power lines accessible, essentially raising the entire park 10 feet up in the air. The park would look a lot like what the previous one had looked like, um, the previous plan, but gone was this idea of periodic acceptable flooding. And the new raised park would now have this 1.2 mile flood wall and millions of tons of earth barged in by the water, which would be a kind of levee. Okay, when that happened, suddenly you had a new group emerge, a group of mostly professionals, professors, artists, other lower Manhattan residents, many of whom didn't actually live next to the park, and who had not been attending those community meetings all those years, they started to organize protests, saying that the plan didn't go far enough to protect against rising seas, and it would destroy thousands of mature trees and squirrel habitats in the park. They didn't believe the experts, they said, who claimed that the original plan to turn the park into a sponge was not feasible. So they started chaining themselves to trees. 
Residents in the public housing projects were upset too by the change of plans, but they had heard from public officials that they had to you know, listen to the new idea, and they eventually came around because their priority was protecting their homes and families from another deadly flood. And gradually, they began to see the opponents of the new plans as interlopers. This is the new plan, by the way, to replace an amphitheater. Renderings always look vaguely ridiculous, but there is one. Um, and they began to see these new people coming in and complaining about the plan as interlopers, because more than a few of them were wealthy and white and living in apartments that were not on the front lines. And as I heard from many of these public housing residents, they really didn't like being lectured by white outsiders and made to feel that they didn't care about the environment because they did. They also just cared about protecting their homes and their, their families. So a project that was devised to build community trust and overcome political gridlock through engagement actually began to fracture the community. As one public housing resident put it to me, the new plan didn't blow up the community. It revealed that there is not a community, and there never was. People just like to throw that word around. So I recount this history at length because the park, I think, exemplifies how, even when there is money at hand and urgency, our decision-making systems often make it difficult or impossible to find consensus and to work at the speed and scale now required by the challenges we face. We are now four, 12 years after Hurricane Sandy, and this is still a rendering. The park is now under construction and may be done in three years. A process of participatory planning evolved to represent other than government in, technocrats and wealthy developers, has created an increasingly weaponized NIMBY culture that can stall or thwart or kill even modest proposals like this one. This is not a new development, of course, and in New York, we can trace its emergence, I think, back to growing resistance to Moses half a century ago. So let's go back there for a second. The 1940s and 50s were the years of Moses' peak authority as New York's planning czar. Among Many other things he saw back then, the addition of a lot of these public housing developments along the East River. But the 1960s brought new thinking. Rachel Carson, the marine biologist and author, challenged the authority of pesticide-making chemical companies and helped inspire the environmental movement. Jane Jacobs took on the urban planning establishment. I mean, in the name of urban renewal, the highways that Moses rammed through the city demolished and split neighborhoods, displacing thousands and thousands of mostly black and brown residents, not to mention fouling the air with car exhaust. Moses said that this was the cost of progress. Cars were the future, suburbs were crucial to New York's econ economic future, and suburbanites wanted to drive into the city. There was, at the time, an economic logic to this. Jacobs argued that ordinary citizens who saw the city from the sidewalk level, not planners like Moses looking down on maps like demigods or developers focused on profits, knew best what ought to be saved or built in their own neighborhoods. Community members were the true experts. Eventually, Moses' power ebbed, and by the early 1970s, an idea called Westway started to take shape on Manhattan's Hudson River waterfront. By that time, Manhattan's west side piers, so here, let's see, can I get this again? This is a very unreliable, but on the left side is the Hudson, on the right side is the East River. So we were talking about stuff on the east side, the right, and actually when New York was developed, that's where the earliest piers were. So colonial era, when you see those photographs of really the busy New York Harbor in the early days, with those ships, that was on the east side mostly. But as ships grew, the East River was not deep enough. Um, and the Hudson was on the other side. So the piers moved to the Hudson side, and that's where all those famous photographs of 
you know, ocean liners and the, the large ships and the large piers uh, grew uh, like a, a, the teeth of a comb along the west side all the way up the shore. I grew up not far from um, one of those piers on the west side. So, but by the 1970s, 60s and 70s, the, the piers themselves, all of the whole New York waterfront was really obsolete because ships had gotten bigger, we had built, you know, uh, highways to move things by car, by trucks and, um, and rail and by air. Um, and so the whole West Side had become uh, derelict. And Westway was a plan to reimagine the whole shoreline. It had become, as I said, um, a wasteland. And there was also an elevated, decrepit highway that separated the city from the river on that side. Um, I'll, I'll explain what this looks like, um, what is going on here. And that, the whole area become really a magnet for crime and, and the, the, that elevated highway occasionally collapsed, taking down trucks and occasionally falling on people. So Westway proposed to demolish the highway and move all that traffic underwater. Now let me just point out what's going on here. This is an example of the landfill that I mentioned earlier. So you see the island growing outward over time. The original island and where Sandy reclaimed was all of that that goes back to that narrower strip on the interior, where you see 1650. And then those piers already went out into the water far onto the west side. Westway was going to demolish the highway and move the traffic underwater. A new interstate would be tunneled just off the shore at the pier line and below the Hudson, obviously. So you removed all those cars and trucks and their pollution from city streets. The warehouses, all those crumbling docks and things would be cleared to, wait, to make way for more apartments and for new commercial developments. And as with the East River Park, landfill would now be added out to the pier line to fill that in to create this vast new green park which would extend from lower Manhattan all the way up to 59th Street. So miles of new green space with bike lanes, little parks within it. And over the next decade and a half, Westway was endorsed by various governors and mayors, architecture critics too. My predecessor, Ada Louise Huxtable, liked it a lot at the New York Times. And then President Reagan even agreed to pay to move the decrepit highway and build the tunnel underground. But the culture had shifted. Now, as more black and brown and Hispanic tenants moved into public housing, let's remember federal and local authorities decided they were not so interested in public housing anymore, and they lost interest in their upkeep. So developments like the ones along the East River which had originally been advertised as this kind of equitable, humane alternative to dense city living, these places came to represent urban decline. And Moses and his whole legacy now symbolized the failure of top-down planning. So newly energized urban activists seized on Westway as an emblem of Moses's arrogant racist thinking. It was somewhat ironic because in fact, Moses didn't like Westway himself. He didn't think the plan was good because he didn't care about building that. He just wanted to restore the highway, but it looked like a Moses plan. So activists now started to petition. They said Westway prioritized drivers, not subway riders, by building the tunnel. It prioritized developers, not blue collar work New Yorkers. And environmentalists in court began exploiting these new environmental regulations. And they focused on one idea that the new tunnel uh, and the new construction would disrupt the mating patterns of striped bass in the Hudson River. Stick with me. So you had now a coalition, a new coalition, wildlife advocates, architectural preservationists who didn't want to destroy all those old docks, public transit users, all of them capitalizing on these new ecological regulations. They challenged the experts who said 
that this would be good for the environment. And they won. So the environmental movement essentially achieved one of its earliest and most signal achieved victories and established a new template for obstructing unwanted development. Now, I should just tell you where I'm coming from. I mentioned that I, I grew up not far from here. I come from a very politically engaged family. You, you can't go farther left. You just can't, trust me. Um, and so, you know, in my universe, Westway was just evil when I was growing up. Um, it just, it, it, was a, it was a given. A Westway, terrible, this is horrible. Um, you know, then time passes and, um, and I write about issues like equity and environmental justice and greening the city and removing cars and all this sort of thing. And I went to look back at Westway and I thought, that's interesting, because if it was a victory of this, for the city or not, I don't know. I mean, in fact, environmentalists derailed, right, would have, would have been a vast greenway, roughly twice the size of East River Park. Um, but it was obviously a triumph for a certain kind of grassroots organization. And it signaled, I think, a new era in participatory democracy. The powers that be had to begun to yield or at least acknowledge the powers of the people. And I don't think it's coincidental, I wrote about this when I was writing about the East River Park, that it was this era that coincided with the rise of the word expertise, which really only came into common usage during the 1960s and 70s as a point of contention, mostly around nuclear power. There's a guy, Gil, Eyal, who's a sociologist who wrote a book called The Crisis of Expertise, he teaches at Columbia. And as he points out, increasingly community, environmental, and other groups began to contest who described themselves as experts. And this led to demands for greater representation in political, infrastructural, civic negotiations. It broadened democratic processes but it also made consensus much harder to achieve because as more and more stakeholders asserted their claim to expertise, others began to question whether they too had a right to be at the table. And in essence, as Eyal argues, a participatory system designed to build public trust has increasingly caused people to lose faith in that system. The solution is not uh, hard to see. It's a slow, open, truly participatory process, like the one that started the conversation around the renovation of East River Park. But clearly, that can run up against both the urgency for change and the priorities of those of certain types of people at the table. You know, in the Netherlands, citizens give up a measure of autonomy two designated experts in return for safety. The Dutch live in what's effectively the gutter of Europe. So flood prevention has been an existential priority for them for a thousand years. And they have these things called the water boards. They've had them for almost a thousand years. And the water boards effectively have last say around many development and planning decisions. You know, where the United States, a very different, we believe democratic ethos is prevails, and we're a nation steeped in this notion of individual liberty, private property, manifest destiny. So no, we don't really, really want to be told, you know, we need to think in terms of prevention or retreat from places that are too unsafe to occupy. We, we're not the Dutch. But what we can, or at least we might try to learn from the Dutch, as Al points out, is that universal participation and transparency may not always be absolute goods. This is a very difficult concept to accept, of course. It can sometimes seem, though, that we used to be able to come together around big, difficult tasks more easily. So a couple weeks ago, I was shooting a short film with Ken Burns, the documentary filmmaker, uh, at the Brooklyn Bridge, which is celebrating its 140th anniversary this year. The bridge was constructed between 1869 and 1883, an era, I will remind you, that so 
69 to 83. Those years saw the completion of the trans first transcontinental railway, um, the opening of the Suez Canal, the laying of the first Atlantic cable, the invention of the electric light, and the telephone. The bridge, sorry, telephone, light. The bridge was, in a way, the ultimate symbol of the era, I think, because like the canal and the cable and the railway, it was, it was a connection. It was a connection across, to, across a vast, previously unimaginable gulf. It was an engineering marvel. It was a work of public art to rival the great Gothic cathedrals and an exaltation, really, of urbanism as the fulfillment of man's democratic ambitions. We forget now that the bridge took three times as long and cost three times as much as it was supposed to, and it was plagued by scandals and deaths in construction. Much of the public had come to believe the bridge was a catastrophic boondoggle and a terrible idea lining the pockets of corrupt politicians and businessmen, and then it was completed, and almost literally overnight, all was forgiven. The opening inspired a celebration that one woman, as Ken reminded me, uh, who lived long enough to see Neil Armstrong land on the moon, um, she saw, she was asked, like, is this amazing, you know, Neil Armstrong? She said, actually, um, the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge was a much, much bigger event than, than the, than the ticker tape parade for whoever, whatever his name was down the. I don't know about you, but I sometimes do fear uh, that we have become increasingly fractured and kind of smug in our silos. We're losing I, our ability, I think, to think beyond ourselves, beyond another news cycle, much less beyond the next election cycle. Sometimes I, I look back in awe and bafflement at, for instance, the institution of the New York City grid, a project begun at the southern end of Manhattan um, in 1811 and completed nearly a century later. So in other words, it spans the age of James Madison, when most of Manhattan was still wilderness and farmland. This was, correct me if I'm wrong, at least 20 years before Illinois was a state, Chicago was Fort, Fort Dearborn. That's what Manhattan looked like. And it was completed when this photograph was taken. That's incredible because the construction of the grid required an enormous collective sacrifice and a commitment across generations through various wars, more than a dozen city administrations. It was, in other words, a collective act of faith which produced the greatest urban agglomeration, the greatest concentration of wealth and cultural capital in modern human history. When was the last time that we, the public, I'm not talking about a bunch of VCs in Silicon Valley talking smartphones or AI, but when was the last time we undertook such a transformative non-virtual project? And I don't know the answer. Maybe you guys have some ideas. Um, I, I don't believe the moon landing qualifies, actually. It was incredible, but short-lived and kind of anomalous. I'm voting for the interstate highway system, which was first talked about during the 1930s, finally begun in 1956 under Eisenhower and completed in 1992 by which time Americans had begun to grasp the environmental costs of our commitment to cars and our divestment in passenger rail. What had seemed in the 1950s like bright, shining progress and was, in fact, an astonishing feat of organization and engineering, let's face it, had already begun to look a little misguided and tarnished because of the gashes it made in the landscape, the carnage to small towns, the sprawl it triggered all across the continent, just as we had come to see that urban renewal was actually herbicide in so many demolished black and brown neighborhoods. 
I think today, if anything, the pendulum of, of awareness has swung to the point that we may now regard the entire industrial revolution more in terms of the exploitation of labor, colonial expansion, the Keeling curve and the Anthropocene era than for its having ushered in the steam engine, incandescent lighting, telecommunications, modern transportation and infrastructure, modern cities, the elimination of countless diseases, the decline of infant mortality, extreme poverty, starvation and illiteracy, the mass distribution of food and water, medicine, education, the rise of the middle class, and so on. In other words, we've gotten very good at identifying mistakes and pitfalls of our earlier ambitions. The question is, I suppose now, what do we do with this more enlightened perspective? How do we build social, political, racial consensus, environmental health and justice, and economic capital around tackling the big problems we face today? And here I think history becomes a useful guide because it is humbling. Looking back, we can now see, for example, what was hard for critics of Westway, like my parents, to notice or admit about the interconnectedness of environmental concerns and urban development. Back then, New York was on the verge of bankruptcy. Land was cheap, rents were low, and it was very difficult, if not impossible, to imagine there would be an imminent need to build more affordable housing. New York was selling off its public land for $25 an acre because it simply didn't want to have to manage it. Urban density as an, as an environmental virtue is obvious to, now, to us now, <clears throat> as is the need to eliminate cars and trucks from streets and the benefits of bikes and sidewalks and parks, as Westway would have given us. That all sounds like good climate policy. But opponents of Westway saw it as simply the diversion of funds from subways, which it was not, and as a threat to the habitats of fish and a handout to private developers, when in fact we needed to build more housing because the government had gone out of the business of building public housing and no longer believed it was American to provide poor and working people with decent apartments. So it was left up to developers to do it, which is where we are now. Instead, of course, the government was heavily subsidizing cars and the American dream of picket fences and backyards and de facto segregated suburbs. And where has this gotten us? Today, the number of severely cost-burdened households, meaning households paying more than 50% of their income on housing, has risen since 2007 by 7% across the country. In cities like LA, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, New York, the story is much, much worse, of course. In New York, rents have risen by 30% since 2015, home prices by 50%. The vacancy rate for apartments renting for less than $1,500 per month, which is the median rent for renter-occupied housing in New York City, is under 1%. And if you want to rent an apartment for $900 or, or lower, it's less than 1%. The affordable housing stock in New York is shrinking, not growing. Between 2017 and 2021, New York lost 96,000 units with rents under $1,500, and it gained 107,000 units with rents of $2,300 or more. I read the other morning that the median rent on new leases is now, than, now more than $4,100 in New York City, up from $3,400 just three years ago. And not coincidentally, homelessness is at record levels. The Times published a report just the other day that 80% of New Yorkers now are severely rent burdened. I mentioned homelessness. We did not always have a homeless problem. Let's remember this too. We created this one. And again, the lessons of history, I think, are instructive. We set the stage half a century ago with the shuttering of psychiatric hospitals in the wake of various abuse scandals and the introduction of new psychotropic drugs. 
This all seemed at the time like a good idea, many to progressive people who argued on behalf of the rights of patients and some of our most vulnerable citizens. At the same time, cities started offering tax incentives to owners of flop houses, uh, single room occupancy hotels, to convert their properties into market rate rentals, condos, and co-ops. As I said, at the time, New York's rental market, its, its economy was in the toilet. So the idea was, let's build better housing. In New York City alone, more than 100,000 SRO units that had housed substance abusers, elderly singles, former inmates, and the mentally ill were erased. This also seemed to many like a humane step because the flop houses were notoriously shabby. And as with the psychiatric institutions, we were really good at getting rid of them, but we were really derelict at replacing them with something better or really with anything. We simply eliminated both mental health and homeless safety nets. And then we passed tax reforms during the Reagan era, which encouraged the construction of high-end single-family homes, but not of affordable multifamily rentals. There were 515,000 new multifamily homes built in America in 1985. After Reagan's laws were passed, just 140,000 of them were built in 1991. So just think about what happened. As fewer and more people are now competing for fewer and fewer apartments, the affordable housing market dwindles and becomes, right, a game of musical chairs played by low-income Americans. And someone is always going to lose. So we began to notice, not coincidentally, at that same time, the emergence of a homeless population in the 1990s. And now we find that many progressives are acting, I think, like reactionaries and doubling down on our inequalities. And I, I'm curious how this has happened. I'll give you just a couple of examples which really piss me off. By the way, sorry, um, I didn't explain that, but the interstate highway system. I'm just gonna give you a few because, one in New York, because it shows you, I think, the way NIMBYism works. In 2016, activists in Upper Manhattan derailed a proposal to construct a 15-story, 355-unit residence on the site of this derelict garage. The building was going to be the first private development under de Blasio's, as I told you, who's the mayor, called Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Program, which was a new law that required new developments on rezoned land, include at least 20% of units below market rate, some kind of affordability, just 20%. Without asking for the rezoning, the developer had, was free to put up a 14-story building with no affordable apartments. So you have to understand, the developer went to the city and asked to build a slightly larger building, 15 stories, 355 units, so that he could make half of the units subsidized, 178 of them, way beyond the requirement. What do you think happened? Opponents in the neighborhood took to the streets, literally declaring the construction of any new market rate housing, quote, an existential threat to our homes and our community. So the developer abandoned the project and the neighborhood, which desperately needs more housing, got zero. You get that. Actually, this was just recently torn down. One more example from our favorite NIMBY city in San Francisco. A developer a few years ago proposed a 16-unit apartment building here on the site of a defunct KFC. The proposal conformed to all sorts of city regulations, which required that it have a pair of affordable apartments proportioned to the 16 units, and no parking because San Franciscans had said that they wanted to encourage the use of mass transit and bikes and not make more room for cars. NIMBY's tied up this plan for years, arguing the developer down to 12 units from 16, 
and adding parking, which the city's planning commission okayed just so the project would get done. But the opponents were still not done. They went to the San Francisco Board of Permit Appeals, which ordered inexplicably the developer to chop off the top floor, causing the project to fall from 16 units to under 10 which meant it no longer needed any affordable apartments either. So at that point, you had a development that would have provided these uh, new apartments, right, with two paltry, two affordable apartments and reduced auto dependency now had no affordable units, more space for cars. It was insane. And only at the 11th hour did the board reverse itself, but by then, the project was done and unbuilt. You know, we've seen a, a 180 in California, obviously, around this thinking, and I think this is important to remember too. Because I've been trying to remind you always about how thinking seemed one thing at a certain point has changed. Back in the 70s, progressives in California were the ones who were arguing against the development and against established assumptions that a growing economy and a rising population were good for the state. But now the median home price in California is $800,000, and you have more than 100,000 people unhoused. So the narrative has flipped. Density is now the environmentally and morally responsible answer to the state's problems. And of course, NIMBYs are against it. But I promise to point towards hope, so I'm gonna end on two, with two points. One I just saw online today, and that is from the state of Montana, where five bills are now winding through the legislature um, with the governor's approval and the approval of many progressives in the state. One to allow for what are so accessory dwelling units. Do we know what those are? Essentially granny flats. Duplexes in lieu of single family zoning, but mostly a lot of deregulation to essentially fast track new development and circumvent the NIMBYs. Why are they doing that? Because they agree that what they wanna do is to protect the state from becoming California, both a place that doesn't have enough housing and a place with too much sprawl, so the environment is protected. I think that's a really interesting alliance in what is a state that, as some of you may know, has been in the headlines recently for its uh, new law against uh, trans rights is also here now ahead of California, New York, Illinois, and so forth in its thinking about development and the link to environmental issues too. And that brings me to another interesting case of a coalition that is dealing with problems productively, which is Houston, the nation's fourth most populous city a blue city in a purple county in a red, red state, which during the last decade has moved more than 30,000 homeless people off the streets and directly into apartments and houses. So I told you that homelessness has declined across the country, and it has. But of course it's risen in certain places. It's risen on the coasts and in big cities, but Houston, is the biggest city where it has fallen the most. The overwhelming majority of the people who it has housed have remained housed for, after two years. The number of people deemed homeless in the Houston region has been cut by 63% since 2011. So 10 years ago, homeless veterans had to wait 720 days and had to navigate 76 separate bureaucratic steps to get from the street into permanent housing with support from social service counselors. Today, the process is streamlined. The wait is less than a month. Houston has gotten this far by teaming with county agencies and persuading scores of local service providers, corporations, charitable nonprofits, organizations that typically bicker and compete with one another to row in unison. Together, they've gone all in on a policy called Housing First, which is a practice supported by decades of research that moves the most vulnerable people straight from the streets into apartments, not into shelters, and without first requiring them 
to wean themselves off drugs or complete a 12-step 12, 12 program or find God or a job. What Houston proves is that if the goal is getting people off the street, housing first works, and it costs a lot less, a lot less than leaving people out there on the streets. This, by the way, is a woman I've spent a good amount of time with. I watched her moved from underneath a highway uh, overpass into this apartment. We carried her stuff and moved her into this place with her daughter, who I'll show you in a second. Now, I said that it costs a lot less, which should be a good argument, but we should also say that moving people into homes should not be measured by whether it saves taxpayers money, I don't think, given that government subsidies are so heavily, wildly tilted towards homeowners. But in any case, Houston system works because the whole subsumes individual contributions into a larger collective endeavor. It finds common ground. The sum is greater than the parts. I'll try to search for other cliches. It requires that dozens and dozens of organizations, public and private, who may have previously done one thing, now must do other things, even if the rewards may feel less tangible and personal, and despite their ideological differences. And that's because Houston came to the realization <clears throat> that problems like homelessness are too big for any of us to solve as individuals or even as individual organizations. It is a systemic problem that demands a systemic approach. And this is, of course, where we are failing as a democracy, not just around homelessness, but around so many issues like flood management and climate change and affordable housing. Mark Eichenbaum, who's Houston mayor's special assistant for homeless initiatives, said to me, <clears throat> housing people is a slow, extremely complicated incremental process that requires all hands on deck all the time if you want to settle for the status quo, much less go backwards. Everyone has to come together around the table. I think that sounds cliched, but it's actually very important. The point is, progress is not an end goal. It is a process. That is the real history lesson, I think. It can be so obvious that we forget it. We need to learn to come together again around what's possible <clears throat> with the understanding that circumstances and perspectives will change. I began with the East River, where a modest solution to a climate problem provoked a multi-billion dollar struggle and a decade plus undertaking that was ultimately manifest in terms of inequitable housing. My point was really that all of these large scale challenges, environmental, urban, social, and racial, are ultimately one and the same, and we need to think holistically and together about them. I'm actually convinced there is now an opportunity to change the prevailing rap, uh, narrative, and I think that opportunity is in your hands. I'm not just saying that because I'm talking here to you. I really do think we're on the cusp of change. I've been around long enough to see that this pendulum does swing quite a few times, and I just have a hunch that right now it's swinging in the right direction. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm happy to chat and take any questions you guys have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Nuthan Barani, and thank you again to um, the UChicago Committee on the Environment, Geography, and Urbanization, to Expositions Magazine, and to the Frizzle family for uh, sponsoring this um, amazing learning series. Um, so thank you again for joining us here in Chicago. Um, I wanted to get right into the conversation, so I didn't even have an introduction. I'm so excited about uh, this. I've been looking forward to this. And I appreciate our uh, discussion just earlier um, about our families, mm -hmm. about generations. Um, many of your written pieces point to the ways in which some of our social systems, and even the most well-meaning of them, have resulted sometimes in convoluted solutions. Yeah. Um, often missing the element of what it is at at the heart of the, of the care. 
it's what is central is really people. Um, in big projects, you point out, and in, as you point out here in um, East River Park, of course, in Houston, addressing the labyrinthian requirements for the unhoused, and they really tackle it straight on as the spaghetti kind of un, um, unraveling. And we see this at the architectural scale, um, as in the Turkey earthquake that you recently um, wrote about in the systems of care within urban places, um, that you know, the building code enforcement is falling down. And so the systems of care there are literally falling down. I bring this to students all over the time. In my course syllabus, the first three sentences of my syllabus is architectures for people, architectures for people, architectures for people. <laughs> yep. So um, it's International Workers' Day. I'd like to talk about care. It is. Um, what are new systems of care that are unfolding that you are seeing, that you're seeing uh, expand or blossom? Um, whether it's through the lens of the built environment or whether you're seeing things that are surrounding um, coming through? That's a really interesting question. Um, and let me turn it just a slight, by the way, I just wanted to say, this is the daughter of the woman who, uh, if I wasn't, her name is Blessed, and uh, Terry's daughter. Um, it's a really interesting question because I, I agree with you that the way we need to think about the built world is in terms of how it cares for people, um, cares for the environment as well, but I think those are the same thing, ultimately. Um, and that, <clears throat> that isn't in conflict, I don't think, with thinking about architecture and, and design um, as a cultural and artistic endeavor. I think. Um, I think when we look at so many of the great um, monuments that we've built, um, we think of them in terms of um, possibly their formal and material uh, invention, but also because of the ways that they have given us something, often something very uh, um, true and deep about our humanity. Um, you're asking though specifically about systems of care um, and so to be a little more nuts and bolts about it, I, I have seen a lot of people working uh, around issues of um, uh, deep affordable housing uh, and community development. Um, and I find that work um, often really the most interesting to write about because um, because of the complexity involved in doing it. It's not do good work. It's actually, it involves working through systems and around problems. Um, and I think that's sort of, there's something very beautiful about it. I like the fact that Houston did this um, and is continuing to do this, um, not through some magic or, but because of an understanding of systems and understanding that everyone has to come together around, you know, it's not a kumbaya thing. It's just a belief that if we agree around a, a problem and tackle it together, we will come up with a system that is, that is going to work. And that system is also, as it happens, you know, going to change the lives of tens of thousands of people. Um, there's something almost um, banal about the practicality of it. Um, that I think is really, uh, yeah, beautiful. I mean, in many ways, you're, it, they're building um, a new infrastructure for care. Yeah, and that's right. That's right. And maybe, maybe we can extend this a little further in thinking about how that new system um, built from the existing systems or the best of the existing systems in a way, um, is that building new trust between people? Is building really a new trust? New, new trust between individuals, between the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, in Houston, that's definitely what you see. I mean, there's a there's a lot of um, there's an enormous amount of distrust, right? Especially around an issue like homelessness. There's distrust uh, among a population of people who have been completely uh, who are at their most vulnerable, lowest possible moments. 
about uh, whether or not they will be able to find people to work with who will actually help them. There's enormous distrust of people living in homes who see homeless outside um, and who are fearful or uh, see people with mental illness or whatever. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that w one of the things that, that this system has done is provide proof of concept. Um, that people see that an encampment is being, as they say down there, decommissioned, but also that the people who are there are not being just told to move on and fend for themselves, but are being moved into houses and that those people are being helped and helping themselves and remain housed. So there's a trust that builds around the system and that trust builds on itself, which I think is crucial because it requires a lot of buy-in, political and, and also emotional from, from both the people on the streets and, and the citizens in, in a place like Houston. I think that's what we don't have, um, and for good reason, because most of our systems around stuff like that, around affordable housing, but certainly around homelessness, are, are complete, not just broken, they're in, in co-ate. Um, you know, one way I've often put it to people is, in Houston what happens is, they, because people are organized and they figure out who's doing what and how to place people where and how to find apartments and, and so forth, that when someone is, is homeless and enters the system or is found and therefore brought into the system, the system is able to send them in the right directions and provide them with what they need. Imagine, you are finding yourself on the verge of or actually homeless. It's, first of all, you know, when we talk about homelessness as a problem of, of addiction or mental illness, that is partly true, but largely not true. And anybody who would find themselves homeless will understand, will, will, would naturally want to self-medicate or be emotionally distressed. or so, this idea that the problem is somehow the addiction and the, I just have to say that. So these people enter that system and they're assessed and the difference would, and then sent in the right direction. So there's immediate care. It, it's, this is the analogy I often give. I flew in from New York this morning. Suppose you said, come to Chicago, um, go to the airport and uh, get here. Okay, so I'm, I go out to the airport. W which airport? I have to find my flight. What, I wander around all these gates? What do I do? Somebody says, well, try this gate over here. Try. Effectively, now you're somebody who's homeless. You have nothing. You're desperate. You're incredibly depressed and ashamed and fearful. And now you're told to navigate a completely incomprehensible system. So when you talk about trust, this is absolutely crucial, that there is a sense that people are caring for you and, and are not sort of leaving you on your own. Are you seeing other patterns or other tendencies, so maybe trust being one uh, maybe principle um, that you're starting to, you know, we're defining maybe just even in conversation. Is there anything else that you've... You sounds like you want me to say something in particular. No, no, <laughs> I just, just I've been thinking about, you know, yeah. and in, in, in reading so much of your work recently, um, and as you talk about sort of being on this, we're on a pendulum swing. Yeah. You know, is, could that swing also incorporate more humanity? Yeah, I mean, I do, th look, I think, I think what I perceive a lot of, and it's what I was trying to talk about here, is that there's an enormous amount of distrust, um, that there's an enormous amount of division, and that we have, fortify ourselves in silos. I know this is a cliche to say, but it, you perceive it when you're trying to achieve things that are complicated. And those things are often around the built world because the built world, things are complicated. There are a lot of people invested. Things take time, cost money. Um, and, and so I, for me, the lack of trust, the, the fragmentation of our culture is, is is constantly on display. It's one reason I want to point to things that 
can work or might be templates for another way of doing things. Um, and to also say, you know, look, I have colleagues who've said, has there been any affordable housing built at all? Anything for people who, are, and the truth is, yeah, it's being done, you know, here and there. But we almost want to, to see failure as an affirmation of some of our own beliefs about a broken society. So I, I think the general fear I have is that we've, we've lost the ability to do big things. But I'm not just saying because I'm here. I, you know, when I talk to younger people, I, I feel a hunger to get involved again in issues like this, which are complicated. People around architecture and design, for instance, who used to talk a lot about, you know, um, really fascinating, um, uh, you know, celebrated architects and their work, are now talking a lot about some of the issues which I came to this job to write about. Um, around you know, social welfare, public health, uh, environmental justice, all these sort of things. And those projects are collaborative. They're not just getting some rich patron to you know, pay for a new museum wing. Um, and I, I think that is, that, that's the, the swing that I perceive, but I think it's going to take yes. a little bit of time. Collaboration, I would, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna shift us to another topic, um, memory, um, and then we'll take a few uh, questions from the audience, I think. Okay, great, great. Um, so again, your writing often points out where we, um, and the, the co large collaborations are, um, or even whole cities have been stymied and thwarted um, yeah. due to being blind to systems that have actually been present all along, or maybe intentionally ignoring some of those systems. So right. um, you know, I'm thinking about the LA River, the great ecological system, the rules yeah. of mother nature that that river is going to follow, right. no matter what. Um, or you know, systemic racism, the collective breadth and the depth um, and the reach of those biases that have, that have led us to unhoused uh, people today, right? Um, but how, how we exist with Mother Nature, how we exist with each other, it's, those things are still in the cobwebs of society's mm -hmm. memory. So what have we forgotten as a society? <laughs> what do we, yeah. what is like the breadth of knowledge that we no longer know or that we really need to relearn, yeah. retool? You know, what are the ways that we're seeing this knowledge re-enter our consciousness? Yeah. I mean, I. What I was hoping I was conveying to you here, moving around a bit, was constantly how we often believe we are doing one thing, and in retrospect, we are doing another. And then we come to look back on that as a failure, whereas in fact, this is the nature of change and often progress itself. That this is the, the very enterprise of caring for each other and building a society and, um, just building period, <clears throat> is that the terms are constantly shifting and that the things that we did before will come to look different. That's why I gave you that long list about the Industrial Revolution. I have talked about the Industrial Revolution with some people who are your age, and it's like, oh my God, this is terrible. And then you'll like go through this laundry list, like, you know, we're sitting here because of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, just like, I, I know that sounds odd, but it is useful to just, to, I think there's a certain element of forgiveness and flexibility and understanding that comes from looking back through history and, and, and seeing how things got to be the way they were. And sometimes one finds in that just, you know, a, a, a web of, of nefarious and horrible things. And sometimes one realizes, as I was trying to suggest to you here, that there were sometimes very good or seemingly good motivations that led people to do things that we now think were mistakes. This, I think, should give us strength, not pause, because we, it, it allows us to feel that the thing we are doing may not be an ultimate solution, but it is a good thing to be doing. We can come around this at least, and then it will change because circumstances change. I think history, that knowledge you're talking about, that memory, is very crucial. We stop often at just pointing out 
the problems or the mistakes that we made. And I think that that's useful, but it's only half, it's only half the job. Um, you know, I, I grew up in this, as I said, this very far left household, and my father was a real dreamer. Um, he was a surgeon and a brilliant doctor and a beloved man and a remarkable, brave uh, person. And he acted on his beliefs. He was with the Freedom Riders in Mississippi. He was, uh, he was very pragmatic in many ways, but his image of the world was shaped by an almost, a sort of almost religious belief in political systems. And I think it formed in me a journalist's inclination to see everything as gray and to atomize the world because it's, that's where the world really is. And I also think that's more interesting. Um, I, I, I think I'm fundamentally optimistic um, and I don't know why, why that is, but I, that it has made me more optimistic to, to go back and look through you know, the past and to, and to see things as shades of gray and not black and white. I, th I, think, that's a, I think that's a source of consolation. Um, I don't know whether that's odd to say, but I find it so. I think it's a source of strength to understand that things are complicated and may not be perfect. That's how we need to operate. And I'm happy to answer questions about other stuff or the Times or Headway or whatever, journalism, whatever you like, up to a point, I suppose. Hi, thank you so much, really appreciate it. I, I wanted sure. to segue right off the last question Newton asked and that's something that's related to the, your response about memory. Um, you mentioned in your response that you um, you know, that sometimes we, very much collective plural, sort of have done things in the past that seemed good, but then in retrospect, they sort of, you know, our, our consciousness evolves. And in a time when it, the world often is sort of so caught up in branding or marketing, um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to sort of not apply that grace to ourselves. Um, and especially, I think, amongst the students I've noticed as a teacher here, um, there's a fear of doing the wrong thing or of in the moment sort of being perceived as doing the wrong thing. And so I'm wondering maybe as a source of confidence to the students in this room, if you could share an example of maybe something you've done or written 10, 15 years ago that in retrospect, you know, you have different opinions about now. Um, I don't know if... So they have done if, wrong? Well, not, not, not necessarily <laughs> wrong, but something that you yeah. really thought at the time yeah. was a sort of really meaningful thing to focus on or do or write about what, or take a position. What a really interesting question, yeah. yeah. That's a really, that's a super interesting question. And needless to say, I totally agree with you. I mean, in my, in my case, I've never really done anything that I regret or think is not perfect. So I'm not really <laughs> sure how to answer it. No, I mean, um, it, yeah, you're 100% you're right. Um, and let me see how I can answer it usefully too, um, both specifically and in general. You know, um, I would begin by saying that I think this is not entirely your generation that has this fear. I think especially when I started at the New York Times, I had a fear of making a fool of myself, had a fear of being somebody who might put my foot wrong. Um, and I think that caused me to write in a certain way that was um, less, how can I put it? less useful, more mundane, more sort of safer, less, um, I don't know. I, I wasn't taking advantage of the situation I had because I feared most of all, like someone would just tell me I was wrong or I was, I was, um, I was foolish or something. Um, and I, 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 understand, uh, but I regret that. I, I, lost, I lost the opportunities to, to participate in conversations that would have been much more robust and useful at the time. Um, and, I, and, it was, and I was less understanding of people's ability to forgive. Um, so there is that sort of general point. Um, 
God, I wish I had something at hand because it, I regret things I did all the time or I think about constantly. I mean, I think that that is sort of in the nature of trying to hold yourself to some um, higher standard. I, I, I constantly look back on things, but I, but I don't regret at all that I, I took some chances. I changed my career a few times and I, I tried to do things I didn't know how to do um, and took a chance of making a fool of myself in public in doing so because I thought that ultimately that would be a great learning experience and again I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly because I'm, I'm searching for an example of a thing I, that I I don't know how many I could search for, but I think that's a much more broader point, which is that um, I learned ultimately to, to try to put myself in a situation that was unfamiliar, um, because it's the only way you can, you can um, grow. Um, maybe it's selfish, but I think it's true. I, I've been incredibly fortunate, obviously, in my career. I just, I, I, I don't take for granted at all that I've been very lucky. And, and so as I've gotten older, I've also learned that that comes with a sense um, that I need to give some of that back. Um, I will say, um, I don't mean that in some charitable way, I mean just by, by sort of putting myself out there and doing the best I can even when I feel I'm not adequate to that task. Um, and forgive me for stumbling over this answer, but I will tell you, I used to be a pianist in my former life and then I, I put that away. Um, and I came back to it later when I was already working at the Times and I started giving concerts. I can bore you about how that happened and why. But one of the reasons I did that was because I thought it was important to put myself in a position of vulnerability in public if I was criticizing other people too. Um, I think it's useful to be, to know what it is like to be on the line um, in some small way, just make yourself vulnerable. Um, so am I getting anywhere near a response that's useful? That's great. I, I didn't have an intention with that. Yeah. Yeah. I worry about it a lot. You know, I have two, two uh, kids and I worry too a lot about a fear about um, putting a foot wrong or being, it's just, um, it's a, it's a, this is a problem I think uh, now. I, I just, I don't know what to say except that um, it's the only way to grow, <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, great talk and I really applaud your, uh, your sort of push to promoting hope, um, but I'm from the Netherlands and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've been thinking throughout the talk um, about what you said about the Netherlands being able to put these, these large infrastructures in place. And I think it goes back to memory a little bit, because these big infrastructural projects were built after the big flooding in 53 in the post-war era. And right now we're at a point where anew we need to um, expand dikes, we need to make more room for rivers, and the same problems arise. Right. So I think even in the Netherlands, yeah. we need to think about building coalitions in, in right. expansive senses. And I was wondering if you could put a few words on the different actors that yeah. you see in this coalition building and who takes yeah. the lead, if anyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and this is, of course, a really a profound point. I didn't want to spend a lot of time talking about the Netherlands, but I mean, so you, this point for those of you who didn't catch this is, so the Netherlands has been dealing with issues around water management for its entire existence, but it took a flood in 1953, which killed various people, to finally enact another, a, a sort of program, a large scale program. And that program produced a lot of things which then turned out to be a mistake. Um, and so there, another sort of evolution, this is what you're saying, of thinking about water management uh, arose, making room for the river and essentially understanding how to deal with water in a different way. I think that's my point actually, that that even a place like the Netherlands, which has developed over time a culture and an understanding around this, 
has constantly to rethink and adapt and has a lot of community resistance to some of these projects and is not sort of, it's, there's no kumbaya or something. It's still a very difficult and ongoing process. But I think you would agree that there is a general um, collective understanding that water is an issue and that its management is something that has to be dealt with and that there are some costs to that. So th there is already a starting point that is different, I think, than you have around issues here. But I like the reason I think the Netherlands is such a useful example is precisely that. It's the same thing I was saying earlier. A, a, a solution can take a long time, so long that by the time it's finally realized, it's no longer the solution. But I think that that is the process itself, um, even, even for a place as sophisticated as that. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. Um, thank you. So I really appreciated uh, what you've been saying about like, giving grace to people and being forgiving and taking a chance on things and having faith in people. But I think there's a, a trend of kind of maybe apathy or maybe like self-centeredness, maybe born of fear or a desire to protect oneself, but just like uh, not a whole lot of desire to put that faith in other people and just kind of rely on yourself and take yeah. steps for your own benefit. So I guess, how would you, mm. how would you um, personally like convince somebody, like take a chance, uh, let's do something together for the community or do create a coalition for, this, for the good of this entire society as opposed yeah. to just for an individual good? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things I've had the privilege of doing is seeing lots of small projects and individual sort of endeavors that, that, that achieve something that may not be enormous, but is very meaningful to a few people. Um, and that, that you, one, it doesn't, you don't have to solve climate change or world hunger, but that there, are, there is an enormous sense of satisfaction and, inst and a, l an incredible learning curve. If you get involved in some tangible project that has some human interaction to it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I suppose there are a lot of reasons why people are fearful to do that or busy or have other concerns. And, you know, I mean, I'm not a, I, I, I'm not a life coach or a psychologist or I, mean, I, I can't speak to any Thing meaningful that way, but I can say that I think engagement in um, engagement sort of that that lets you see that the sum is greater than yourself is really kind of um, uh, it's it builds on itself. I think, but but let me say something about that. This is slightly off track because it's occurring to me. What I'm not suggesting is you go volunteer in a food bank exactly. You know, one of the things that was interesting about doing the Houston Homeless Project and still going back there, I was there again last week, is that you realize that with certain kinds of problems like that, the, as I said, the problem is larger than any individual or any individual group. And one of the problems around it is that you have a lot of people who think that they're doing good things, and they are within their little circle, but they're not coordinated. There's no sense of teamwork. It, it would be as if you had, you know, baseball players who just chose their own positions and batted in whatever order they want, and it just, I mean, it, it's chaos. We would never accept that, that a problem like this um, does require a certain amount of coordination. So I'll give you an example about a food bank. If you work in a food bank, um, let's say, and you're in a place that has a large homeless problem, that is absolutely great and, and fine. And um, my wife used to do this too. Um, but a food bank's measure of success might be that they fed 500 people last week, and at the, sa the, the previous year, the same week, they fed 250 people. So they're feeding twice as many people. And then they can go also to funders and say, you see, 
we're more successful than we used to be. You might ask a question, if you're feeding twice as many people, what are you actually doing to help hunger and homelessness in the city? You may be doing much less than you actually think. So I, I, I've drifted from an answer to your question, which was that I think you know, there is an enormous sense of fulfillment in the directness, like the directness of feeding um, someone. And that is, that is, of course, good work. But I think we have to also understand certain kinds of problems as being uh, larger than that. And so finding the right role within that is actually where the satisfaction comes. Even, even some of the sacrifice that has to be made in terms of individual fulfillment for that larger goal. Um, yeah, again, I've strayed too far to answer your question directly. It's difficult. Look, I, when I was your age too, I, I was very involved with my own stuff and my, you know, I, it's hard um, to do something that's not simply performative or for your resume. Um, and, and, and it can seem fearful like you're putting yourself out there. Um, but I wish I had done more of that when I was your age. I really do. Yeah. Hi, I have a question about, um I love the talk, but I have a question about kind of the scale of democracy and how you see yeah. the role of the city versus maybe the neighborhood versus the state versus the federal government in terms of people yeah. gaining the right skill set and learning how to engage one another. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, because a lot of the examples we talk about are kind of on the backdrop of the New Deal and this relationship between the federal government and cities and states where... Yeah. You know, one thing about big projects is they often have big bills, you know, right. and the federal government has kind of taken that up. And so, you know, in, in local settings, people kind of can come together around a problem, but it's really right. hard on the federal level right. um, to do that. So, like, is there a tension there between that? And, and that might just be an economic question, but um, yeah, I think also course. there's the negative kind of impact of the federal government in terms of everyone having a nationalized sense of what's yeah. political, you know, and so like in some ways is the city a bastion of hope? How much are the things around, the chaos around it going to cause problems? Yeah. Uh, You're asking a question about, um, you know, uh, spheres of influence on city, state, federal, county, whatever levels, and I think that's a really good point. I, um, I will remind you, though, that, I, that we've gotten away from this a little bit, but during the talk, I, I also raised the point that Gil Eyal says, which is that we need to be honest about <laughs> questioning the values of participatory democracy. It's a shibboleth, but it's a problem very often. And, uh, you know, this is a tension we um, have not entirely resolved. I don't have an answer to it, but when you talk about governance and decision making and who has authority, this is a problem um, in many cases. And none of us really want to talk about it. In the same way, by the way, we don't want to talk about the fact that we undid our, um, our mental health system um, and now we don't know what to do about it, but we clearly have you know, a population of people um, where, and you see in certain places, maybe here in Chicago, but certainly in California and other places, a movement to reinstitute some kinds of enforcements around mental health. Um, many of us have members of, you know, our family who are, uh, you know, have mental health issues and don't want help and, you know, this is a problem. And because, again, it runs up against this notion of individual freedom and this idea that people should be allowed to, you know, we don't want to get back into the business of telling other people what they have to do and so forth. Um, yeah, it, this is also, I think, a pendulum issue. So I just want to put that back in your minds and liberate you to at least be able to open up a conversation around this. I think we need to figure out what we think. Around city, state, and federal, I mean, look, Houston is, again, an interesting example because the state is extremely hostile to what Houston is doing, which is kind of unbelievable because Houston is doing what ostensibly you would want, which is get people off the streets. But politically, that's not very useful in Texas. And the federal government has its own motivations and interests when it is dealing with homeless issues 
So for instance, the federal government has funding streams for cities that have really large unsheltered populations. And Houston used that as funding streams to jumpstart its success. Now, Houston success means it cannot get that kind of federal funding. And so it has to find other ways to keep itself afloat, to essentially continue to function the way it does, just to keep in place. Um, and that's, that's a broken system, fundamentally. I mean, you can understand the logic, but it clearly isn't right. So, right, I mean, this is, this is in the nature of, I think, governance and, and those funding streams, but we have to at least be able to talk about them rationally and not have our you know, eyes roll from boredom or whatever, and that's, that's an issue around these kinds of really, really big problems. Affordable housing is, is a key one. I, I just, the last thing about that, I keep coming back to this, I wanna reinforce, I also stuck in there, the, pub, the federal government used to build public housing. That was part of the New Deal, but it started before the New Deal. And the idea was that we would supply this housing. I mean, I'll be blunt, we did it because that was housing for white families, starter homes for white families. Once public housing started to be integrated, like, we don't wanna have anything to do with public housing anymore. So what did that mean? That meant that the system was changed to incentivize private developers to build that housing and give them tax breaks. And that's where we are still, all these decades later. <clears throat> it's disgraceful. But, you know, we sort of failed public housing, then we blame the residents of public housing and say public housing is a failure. And then we don't want sort of to acknowledge that we're just having this system depend <coughs> on private profit, which is how this works now. So again, this is a conversation we need to have rationally, and it can't just be all developers are evil and we have you know, this kind of thing. The system is complex and we have to unpack it. And we're not going to start building public housing at a federal level again. There isn't support for that. We abandon that and we're not going to do it again anytime soon. So that's not a realistic goal. We have to come up with something better. Sorry. Um, we're well over time, but Michael, you take one more question? Sure. Okay. I got nowhere to go. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, sometimes we have consensus at the conceptual or abstract level, but yeah. when we reach to the concrete solution, there is a impossible to do it. Yeah. I'll give you an example. In San Francisco, homelessness is a problem. Everyone say yes. Do we want to solve it? Everyone say yes. Housing first is a solution. Everyone agree. But you put your finger any place in the map. Right. Not in my backyard. Correct. Mentality, kick it out and make it impossible. Do you see any path? to move from that conceptual, yeah. at the conceptual level to the concrete examples? I mean, th this is a good example around uh, governance and authority because ultimately, of course, you're absolutely right. And <clears throat> as I was saying in this, that you know, even the thinking around development shifted. Suddenly people who call themselves progressives now find themselves NIMBYs and reactionaries. So, I mean, <clears throat> I think the only answer is to impose regulations and do it at a state level. So um, I think the state has been finally making some efforts to enforce some new regulations around single family zoning, um, around, uh, you know, ADUs, around uh, transit oriented development. Um, but it's not going to come from a consensus. It's just not. And for some politicians, it's a kind of political suicide. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think it has to come over the dead bodies of a lot of people who are taxpayers and, and don't want to do it. I, I don't see another way. They're, they're not going to be persuaded. That's why I found the Montana example really interesting, actually, because you have a very red state with a quite reactionary governor. Um, but finding common ground around that issue at a point at which there is still the possibility uh, of building alliances um, because so much of the state has not yet reached the point of California. I mean, that, it's, that's an interesting 
you know, two days ago, the state wasn't making headlines and it became sort of public enemy number one to many people on the left. And then now you could say, well, actually, that's the much more progressive state. Then, so th there are places, I, there is common ground, I think. And in states like California, I think where that's no longer possible, it, I just, I don't see another way around it. You're not going to persuade a lot of these older white NIMBYs that they should let there be much more development. They, they don't see, they will never see the benefits. They don't. And by the way, I'll say, as somebody who writes about architecture, of course, which I have not been talking about here, historic preservation has become also a weaponized terrible, horrible weaponized instrument like, like, the, like environmental legislation. And it needs to be really drastically rethought um, in ways that I think are also much more oriented towards social preservation and a question of cultural, uh, uh, the broadening of the definition of culture so that we, when we talk about what we want to preserve, what we want to preserve are neighborhoods and prevent displacement of vulnerable populations, but also vulnerable businesses, perhaps, or vulnerable institutions that could be displaced. And that's what we often mean when we, when we really think about preservation, not using you know, a historic building as an excuse to prevent the construction of you know, large-scale new housing, um, which is, in some cases, um, more than some cases, you know, the problem. In New York City, the, you know, there are thousands of churches which are disused. Um, you know, some of them, and in my neighborhood there's one, and there's enormous resistance to tearing it down, though it has literally no constituency any longer. And it's not a particularly distinguished building, it's just old. So, the, but you have that, my neighborhood is one of the most reactionary in terms of nimbyism in the country. It's, it's disgraceful, and they're never going to change. So I don't know if it's undemocratic or not. I think ultimately democracy is about doing <clears throat> what's best for the largest number of people. You're never going to find a total consensus. So I still think that's democratic. Does that make sense? I don't know. California is really off the, off the rails, though. But... Thank you guys. You've been very patient. I've a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you.